Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm just going to take you on a small journey about food and what it actually does, I mean, you know, uh, not, not only to your body, but deeper within. Um, to begin with, I would actually like to start with a small story, a story about a couple of guys, techies, who, um, you know, after living um, life, fast life of like pizzas and junk food and beer and late light, you know, party sounds familiar, right? Um, decided to, you know, take a clean break and decided to go healthy. So what they decided to do was they went out, checked out all the health information, included everything that people people said about being um, uh, healthy, eating healthy, and uh, sorry, uh, and you know, did everything like jogging, you know, exercising, replaced beer with green tea. What happened after that? Six months later, one looked like this. The other one, unfortunately, looked like this. So what's happening here? It's very evident that one diet doesn't fit all. Sounds familiar? A lot of people might be trying to lose on weight, but just nothing seems to be working. Why is it? Right? So if you look at what we've been doing all these years, we've been giving um, dietary regulations that's for an average. So government regulations and nutrition societies and medical bodies tell you that 70% of your energy needs to come from carbohydrates, 15 to 20% needs to come from protein, and another 15 to 20% needs to come from fat. Yet, when people follow this, why is it that they don't lose weight? Why is it that there is still so much of chronic diseases like diabetes and you know um, obesity that's still plaguing us? So um, it, it, it's quite evident that food actually affects us, right? So if you look around here, look at each of you, I mean, you know, neighbors, right? Each one of you is different. Each one of you is unique. Each one of you dress differently. Each one of you speak differently. Each one of you walk differently. So obviously, it's, you know, it's fundamental that food also affects you in a different way. What makes this? Wha what, what, why does food affect each one of you in a different way? It boils down to your DNA. It boils down to what you have within yourself. So how do we actually know that food affects our genes, right? Um, this is actually a very um, historical example, and you would actually realize the profound effect that food has on your body. This was in uh, during uh, World War II, when um, there was a Nazi barricade of certain parts of the Netherlands. And this is uh, pretty much known as a Dutch famine study. Results that came out of the study showed that during this period of time, suddenly one fine day when the residents woke up, they didn't have any food. They had to survive on less than 30% of their energy coming from, you know, from food. And what happened was when, the when researchers evaluated people, um, you know, of this, uh, you know, when they were actually, so, um, like, for example, when they actually evaluated uh, individuals who were conceived in the first three months of the barricade. The barricade went on till the spring, okay? So the peop individuals who were conceived in the first trimester, I mean, first three months and when the first trimester, they compensated for their, you know, uh, lack of food in the first three months. They, you know, were born with a normal weight, but they suffered from diabetes, they suffered from hypertension, you know, uh, they suffered from all the chronic diseases and obesity. And the most important part of this was their children also suffered from the same. You know, that's which means that food is not only affecting our generation. Food, you know, affects, makes such a profound change of the genome that it affects the next generation, our children. You know, it's so, so important. So we knew that, okay, genes, you know, food affects our genes. But you know, where does it affect? Which gene does it affect? Any idea? Well, the Human Genome Project, which was completed in 2000, helped us do that. Now, the Human Genome Project, they mapped our genes on a you know, piece of chip. We knew what we were comprised of. And we were able to tease out you know, the genes, the food that had an effect on these genes. You know, this uh, you know, gene lit up. This gene silenced, got silenced, and that was tremendous power that we have now. 
So, so I before I tell you this story, I want to have I want to ask you, how many of you stay away, run away from your green leafy vegetables? A uh, show of hand, please. Ah, you go. You were just going to think about that after I finish this. Just wait and watch. See, uh, you have DNA, and DNA. If you look at these green, you know, jewels that are surrounding them, those are methyl groups. And a DNA that has these methyl groups are called methylated DNA. These methyl groups are very powerful epigenetic tags that we call them, and they have the power to silence genes. So, in 2007, uh, a bunch of researchers in the U.S. Um, uh, you know, created mice that had the agouti gene. Agouti gene, agouti uh, is a gene that's present in all mammals, and they created a mice that did not have uh, methylated agouti. It was unmethylated. And what happened was, these these mice were actually yellow in color. They were fat. They had diabetes. They had heart disease. They had cancer and died. And they were like, okay, now let's. What do we do? So the researchers shushed up a bunch of greens, you know, all the green leafy vegetables that they could get, and fed it to the mothers. And they said, let's see what happens to the babies that are born. Here you go. You know, the babies that were born were thin, were brown, and lived forever. The power of green. What's happening here is the dietary folate and the folic acid that's coming out of these green leafy vegetables are providing the methyl donors for the DNA. I hope the people who raise their you know, hands will rethink about running away from greens after this. So we looked at how food affects our genes. But is the reverse true? Do genes affect the food we eat? So post um, the Human Genome Project, and since we were able to tease out a lot of these things, there was a number of fields that came up, uh, you know, which was like nutrigenomics, nutri genetics, which are still in their you know, infancy. And what these, guy, what these uh, researchers in these fields started doing is they started incorporating the best practices from biocomputation, bioinformatics, systems biology, molecular biology, the whole, you know, um, the whole, uh, most of these, uh, later sciences and started looking at how nutrition affects genes. And so here, with, with thanks to this science, what we are now able to do is we are figuring out that foods actually you know, get affected by what genes you have in them. So if you go and get your genetic profile done, your genomic profile done, you can actually see which are the foods that you eat and which are the foods you shouldn't be eating. So the first thing that I would like to talk here, uh, talk, I mean, you know, mention here is the uh, CYP1A2 gene. This particular gene belongs to a bunch of, you know, uh, to a group of enzymes that are involved in detoxification. And this particular gene um, is involved in caffeine metabolism. Now, if you have a carrier of, um, uh, which means, uh, a carrier basically means a person who basically has a mutation in this particular gene, he shouldn't be actually drinking more than two cups of coffee a day. Because if he did, he would actually have an increased risk of developing hypertension and heart attack. There you go. Another thing Im very important that I would actually talk, I mean, it's very relevant in India as well, is the MTHFR gene. Remember the greens? Remember the methyl donors? This enzyme is very important in there. The methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase is an enzyme that makes the dietary folate that you eat available to the body. So if there is a polymorphism or a mutation in this particular gene, dietary folate is not available. Methyl groups cannot be passed on to the DNA. And you end up with every sort of diseases like hypertension, cancer, obesity. And if the carrier happens to be a pregnant woman, there is a high risk of the child having neural tube defects. So what do you do? You screen them, you find. What do you do? Corrective practice. You either give them a form of folic acid that's available to the body and which does not require this enzyme, or you increase the amount of 
um, green leafy vegetables or any other food uh, foods that give a lot of fo I mean folic acid in the diet. So this is the way you prevent disease. So what's in the future, right? I mean, this is ah, all very interesting, very excitement. What what do we have in the future? You know, uh, <coughs> when we go and tell counsel a patient, you know, they will like say yes, 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 we'll do it, and then you know the person is just not going to do this. You know, they will just turn around and say, ha, no, one day I'll do it. It's okay, I'll take a cheat day. This is my cheat day. Now what's actually happening, and researchers are actually, uh, the data is coming in that patients are actually complying to what we are actually saying. So when you say, when you tell a patient that you have an increased risk of hypertension, you should be reducing your sodium content, now the message sinks in. He gets it. The second thing that is, uh, you know, which is a pet favorite of mine is, perhaps a revival of Indian, you know, ancient Indian food knowledge. Like if you, um, your, your grandmother, you know, you're sick with a cold, she would say, just take a cup of milk, add some turmeric, add some pepper, drink it up, go to bed, you'll be fine the next day morning. Over a period, what's actually happened is we've compartmentalized everything into buckets. Like, you know, when we were went to nutrition school, they teach us that everything, carbohydrates are one, proteins are, you know, pulses are one. There are no individualized saying that, you know, you know, these are the phytonutrients in this, these are the phytonutrients in this. So there would be a difference between each one of this. And over a period of time, what's happened is this knowledge that we've had is kind of been swept away. And what I'm really hoping with this genomic era that we are in, we will be able to revive that. Because now we'll be able to know what that turmeric does what you know ginger does and what pepper does so that's uh, that's my hope for the future a second thing is uh, you know the third thing rather is um, you know we um, nutritionists are not really taken seriously you know we always always been given the short stock you know even our near and dears don't spare us um, a colleague's a husband of my a colleague's husband came to me once and said you know, Shri Priya, you guys should really make up your mind. You know, 20 years back, you said that this is bad. Like, you know, for example, coconut oil, you know. Now you come and say that this is, you know, will will do everything for you. Drink it, eat it, have a bath, gargle with it. What's happening here? So you've got to remember that these data that, you know, we, we the guidelines that we've been forming is based on an average population where they are not segregated for gene-specific behavior, gene-specific, you know, the way they behave. So what I'm actually hoping that we would be able to do that kind of classification and come up with more robust, you know, nutrition knowledge that, you know, people wouldn't be coming and saying, why did you guys change your mind? When I talk about classification based on your genotype, right now what we do is we classify people according to the phenotype, for example, BMI of over 30, obese, you know, and you do this, this, this. But what I really would like to do is within that BMI of 30, which are the guys who are having a particular gene polymorphism? Which are the set of genes that are gone in this number of people and this number of people and this number of people? And accordingly create a personalized plan for them. That's when nutrition intervention will be effective. So should we all get profiled, right? That's what you might be thinking. After this thing, let me just go, give my, you know, get it done. Um, the jury is still out there on that, according to me. Why? Um, sorry. See, because you've got to remember that um, disease, most chronic diseases are multifactorial by nature. Obesity is not just a disease of gluttony. Obesity could also be caused because of lack of physical exercises, hormonal imbalances, the works. So you need a systemic approach wherein you have the entire, um, you know, all the causative aspects being evaluated and then you need to take a call on this. So just a genomic profiling and, you know, working on that will not really help you. Um, the second thing is that, um, all genes, um, I mean, most chronic diseases are not caused because of a polymorphism or a mutation in a single gene. They have multiple genes that are involved. 
So, you know, I like to take it as an analogy to your going home, right? You have multiple routes to go home. You just don't have single. The same way the body works. Your cellular machinery, your cellular pathways in each of these, they have to survive, right? So they have multiple routes to getting to that place. So obviously, you know, disease is not caused because of just, most diseases rather I should say, is not caused because of a single gene mutation. That's something you have to really remember. The third and most important aspect of it is there are ethnic differences in our genomes, right? The Caucasians and us, we all look different, right? I mean, come on, yeah? We don't look like Caucasians, Caucasians don't look like us, Africans don't look like us. They're all different. Unfortunately, what's happening right now is most of the data that we're using in India is based on Western data. We have very little ethnic data that's available. So for us to actually make you know, an efficient intervention, an efficient thing, you really need Indian-specific data. And I believe in the future that we're going to be able to convert all these that I just mentioned into our strengths, and we will be able to create precise, personalized nutrition that will help us be healthy, happy, prevent or postpone disease. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would just like to say one thing before uh, we I step out. When you get to the dining table, remember that you're not only taking your appetite, you're taking your genotype as well. Thank you very much. Bon appetit. <laughs>